Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the South Africa podcast. You're listening to myself, Ivic Wolf, here uh, on furry.fm. Hopefully, you're all having a great evening. This evening, we have with us uh, Rhythm Bastard, also known as Eric. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> And our uh, wonderful co-host with Scratch here. Hello. We're going to be talk, and we're going to be talking about Rhythm Bastard and what Rhythm Bastard is. And um, okay, cool. So the voice is uh, clear now, by the way, which is great. Hopefully, that stays throughout the entirety of the podcast. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so let's uh, let's first talk about your sort of, you know, how did you get into music? Let's let's start there. Okay. Um, uh, well, I first got into music, I think, to the video game Guitar Hero. I remember uh, going through it at like this uh, digital life convention a while ago. And um, I, I remember loving the game just so much. And by the time the second one came around, I was, my dad suggested like, hey, why don't you play the real thing? And eventually I did. And I think the name Rhythm Bastard does come from the fact that when I was learning guitar, I was learning uh, all the songs from the video game Rock Band. And what I realized was, well, eventually I'm going to you know, want to branch out and do other things. So instead of uh, RB for Rock Band, I changed it to Rhythm Bastard because... Um, because at the time I was reading a little comic called Trans Metropolitan. Okay. And he was, uses the word bastard a lot, so that's where that came from. E explain trans. Sorry, trans metropolitan. Trans yeah, yes, trans metropolitan is basically a comic from the '90s um, that it was written by uh, I think Warren Ellis, and it's basically like um, Hunter S. Thompson, but in the future. So oh, it's okay. you know it's about this journalist, and it's about his you know escapades, like navigating you know this this political campaign, and just the the. The general uh, being in this weird city after he was—he's been a recluse for several years. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's really good. Good to recommend. All right, and so your like instruments of choice, and I know that I've seen like you—you you tend to use electronics here and there, but the the guitar is is all you, and the vocals yes. are all you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any sort of? co-cast members as we'd like as i'd like to call them uh not really like i pretty much write all of the parts and one of the things that sort of helped me out being from this rhythm game background is that i can look at you know how these songs are charted in the video game and kind of pick apart like okay how did they do this or how does this beat work how does this line work and it just contributes to this very analytical perspective on things so i can also break it down and make it my own but like on stage it's just me so i do for bass i tune my guitar down an octave and the drums i use a midi program and you know like midi is for like all the synth parts in some of my songs okay that's awesome um uh yeah i've i've only like had some some tangential experience with uh, with sort of MIDI uh, audio creation. I'm assuming the uh, workstation that you use has um, like a bit of an extensive library of uh, what do they call those? Like sound palettes or what are they called? I mean VSTs, but yeah, that that's VSTs, that's kind okay. of what my computer. Yeah, and a lot of them were just inherited from an old friend of mine who. Um, who I, uh, you know, like, uh, not I worked with uh, in college, and he's just like, when I went away back to, you know, after college, he was just like, yeah, you can just have these. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's pretty nice, because those things can go for quite a bit last time, I remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lucky. So, I yeah, mean... they can be ridiculously expensive. Sorry. With uh, with that experience and, and all of that, like, I, I, would, I do want to be... I want to speak about your your influences um, musically, and maybe just pick that apart a bit. So, exactly, sort of, where do these influences come from? Like, who who are the bands that that inspired you the most? 
I'm definitely a product of like the late '90s pop punk boom. So a lot of Blink-182, a lot of Green Day. Uh, a little bit later, I got uh, into the Aquabats, uh, a punk band that has been around for a while. They started out ska, but now they're doing more synthy stuff akin to Devo. And okay. yeah, that's pretty much where I come from. I can't say I've ever heard of the Aquabats, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, they're really good. Uh, they are, I mean, they're a bit silly with their premises. Like, um, you know, in all of their live shows, they have these big monsters and, you know, these big suits that they come out to fight. And it, it's just, just a, a rollicking good time all around. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. But a bit of like on stage presence as well. Oh, like, yeah, definitely. Nice. That's really cool. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Yeah, go. No, go right ahead. You, you first. <laughs> no, um, uh, yeah, I, I can, I can see from some of your uh, earlier work, like what is this hardcore, nerdcore, punk rock? That's a, that yes. sounds like a bit of an interesting mashup. Could you sort of uh, explain that kind of? Uh, I suppose the influences are are clear, but um, yeah, the uh, what's his name? What, what what were you going for there? Um, so hardcore nerdcore punk rock is just kind of a thing. I, it's you know, it's a word I made to brand myself a bit because um, I primarily did it, you know, just because I, you know, within the nerdcore space, there's not a lot of people doing, um, you know, like straight up punk rock. Usually, mm -hmm. the most you'll get is something like Kirby Crackle, where uh, you know, there's definitely that. Uh, there's definitely like some rock influences, but it's not straight up punk. Yeah, I understand that from the little bit that I've been in the nerdcore scene. But yeah, because um, that's mostly yeah. What, well, like, what would you in the nerdcore scene? What would you describe to be the main influence there? Like, what kind of genre? What kind of uh, definitely mix are going for? Hip hop. Okay, a lot of hip hop. Uh, thankfully, you know, a lot of it is from sort of the older, more lyrical and rhythmic style of hip-hop like if you listen to someone like mc front a lot he it's like the way his voice kind of warbles it definitely plays around with you know the um he plays around with timber a little bit and it voice sounds like it's going through blah blah pedal and it, it just brings out this really this really uh interesting dichotomy oh, okay that's awesome that sounds that sounds pretty cool yeah all right um and I mean, looking at some of your, your other work here, um, like, and honestly, like I've been, I've been trying to listen to a large amount of your music as well. Uh, so you, you tend to take that sort of garage, um, approach to everything where it's unfiltered, it's un sort of refined. Um, is there, is there method to that madness? It's just kind of whatever I think sounds cool. It's and mostly it's been, you know, like my uh my process has been whatever sounds the most fun to play on stage. <laughs> yeah, because if you're not having fun then what's the point? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, and thank and actually uh I got emailed very like a short while ago that I am going to be playing at uh, my first con of the year, which is Megaplex, a furry con down here in Florida. Friday at midnight, so I'm going to try to play up that, like, midnight show angle. Oh, nice. Yeah. That, that's cool. That sounds fun. Yeah, definitely. So that brings us to the inevitable question. Like, as a person who, at this point, I'm going to say is furry adjacent, how did you get mixed up with the furries to begin with? So it basically just became... So at first it was like I just saw a lot of furries in the game Second Life because I was really into the poker scene in um, Second Life. So, um, but that was, you know, before like international laws and everything and they had to uh, suspend it. But yeah, uh, I kind of like just saw everyone around in uh, Second Life and then uh it was just this like rabbit hole, pun intended. Um, I went down on Twitter where it like I just happened to follow like a bunch of cool artists and people, and it was like, oh wait a second, they all happen to be furries, and it just sort of you know led one person to another, and it's just like this this network where it became um, 
Oh, wait a second, huh? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to delve into this just a little bit more. Like, I mean... Yeah, sure. So, you, you get involved with furries tangentially in that kind of way, and suddenly you're busy, you know, doing music uh, for them. Are there any specific groups or things that you're, like, projecting right now? Uh, what do you mean? Like, are there any projects that you were working on with furries for furries? Um, I mean, definitely. I, I really, I mean, like Thrash Panda is one of my favorite songs that I play live. And I did like developing the Thrash Panda character from, you know, my song Thrash Panda. So A, I am working on like a Thrash Panda, like fursuit head to wear at cons. And I am sort of, you know, trying to work on more songs that also incorporate the uh, character. So I think that's what to look forward to. I guess it's just a matter of like me just trying to have the confidence and the reach to feel like I can, okay, I can branch myself out here. All right, cool. And yeah, yeah. It's good to see that you're sort of, uh, I wouldn't say like including furs in, in your music, but uh, just sort of bringing a bit of that element in for like for the sake of i don't know showmanship more than anything else but yeah yeah definitely because i like at the end of the day i you know like furries are just nerds that own the means of production yeah <laughs> so there is so what i like about the culture is that there's no central fandom to um there's no central fandom to it it's not like you know and then i know you know a lot of, like nintendo and disney and the like uh do you know, make um, material that is you know, popular with furries, but there's no one that really, like, owns it. There's no, you know, like, central corporation that kind of determines what is made. Mm. So it's very, it's a very creator-focused fandom, and that's why I kind of like the opportunity to play at Megaplex, because it, the typical anime shows I play, I'm sorry, the typical anime cons I play, there is sort of this element of... Okay, well, you know, like, what are you, okay, like, what have you got for me? Like, mm. is it something that's familiar to me? Is it covered off, a, you know, a popular anime I like or a popular whatever? You know, like, if you don't play Megalovania, then what's the point? But, <laughs> but because, like, Furry is just a more creator-focused fandom and there's, like, every every character involved is someone's OC, A, I don't have to feel bad about not being caught up on the latest thing, mm -hmm. and B... You know, it kind of encourages people to sort of share that little piece of themselves. So it's like, oh, okay, you're into, you know, okay, so this is how you came up with this, and this is what you like to do, and this is how you contribute in some way. Yeah, I, that's always that's always something that I've really loved about the Furry Phantom is that, like, that, like you said, there's no one that centralizes the like the creation of someone's character, and nothing's really, I can't say based off of anything else, but how can I put this? When when an anime runs dry, people will eventually, like, it'll peter off. It's like, there has to be a wellspring of source material for people to work from. Whereas, furries just sort of come up with the stuff either either in a vacuum or through uh, taking some elements from, from this person, some elements from that person. But it's not built um, exactly like two spec from like an anime or something like that. Right. And it, and it's not like, you know, the star Wars fandom where, or it's just pretty much like any other corporate thing where it can be inclusive because somebody actually wanted to be inclusive. It's not mm -hmm. like what you get with Disney where they've had their first queer character, like 13 times now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's... Speaking of which, which one is it? <laughs> I I don't know. There's uh, there's like I think they're up to like maybe thirteen by now. I don't know. It might actually be thirteen, but I don't. You know, no. I'm just giving an example. But yeah, so it's sort of like it's like, hey, wait a second. I want to see this, so I am encouraged to make it. And it's that DIY attitude that I really like. Yeah, that that that's definitely yeah. Like I said, something that I enjoy about the furry fandom. I mean, it's it's also technically very punk. Like, yeah, yeah, it's like fails. they go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to, a, to a degree, definitely. 
I want to talk about some of your previous albums uh, just a little bit. I mean, I'm actually quite interested here in Status Quo Radio. Yes. Uh, I mean, you call it a rock opera for starters. Yes. Like, what? What's the what's the sort of gist behind it? Like, let's. I, I want to sort of like have a deep delve into some of the albums, the songs, what they mean, uh, that that kind of stuff. Like, oh let's, yeah, let's, let's do a deep dive. Yeah, status Quo Radio is actually a good place to start because that started uh, uh, that started life as like a Team Fortress 2 concept album where I'd write one song about each of the nine classes. Interesting. Then as yeah, then as I started writing it and I got really into Janelle Monet, I it kind of took this different shape and I was able to change the structure of it or rather the story of it. Um, while still keeping that same, you know, one song that represents each class in the game. So the story is of a, uh, God, I forgot the blurb I wrote down for it, but it's a story of love, revenge, and ultraviolence in the 1960s Southwest, if I recall. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And uh, basically, like, it came from, okay, I'm going to write one song about each of the nine classes of Team Fortress 2, and it became this thing of... You know, uh, this this guy, Rhythm Bastard, who was the, the the leader, the front man of this, you know, like old school 60s band called The Bastards. Uh, he, him and his band make it big. Uh, turns out he rebels. He doesn't want any of that. So he ends up like fleeing from a whole bunch of stuff. And he meets up with somebody he really loves. But that turns sour and he's back with the uh, back with the uh, old company again. It's. It's. I. It, it would. Pro I feel like I should probably break it down song by song if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, honestly, go right ahead. Like, okay. if, you feel, if you feel up to it, sure. It, sure. it sounds okay, like it'd me, be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Okay. So, status quo radio. It's just the the phrase status quo radio is just a phrase I had in my head that just sounded cool. Um. But I. Uh, let me just. It, Shake a double to look here. Um, so, with uh, so the first song, uh, no, I'm sorry. The first, let me just look at it. So that's supposed to be like the song written by the band The Bastards. Then the next song uh, in a list today is where after the the bastard leaves, is that he goes and joins the army. The song Force of Nature depicts him, tells a little bit about his backstory and him leaving the army, running away. And then Fire Knight is, hey, wait a second, there's this place where I'm free to perform again. Okay. All right, then Act 2. Oh, God, I got it. And then Act 2 is uh, Radio Days Part 1 and 2. It was written a lot about uh, my experience going to college for the first time. And the, the first song, Part 1, was when I was first entering college and I was very optimistic about the kind of good life I'd lead. But part two is sort of when I actually started getting into the workforce and it wasn't so good. <laughs> you know, I was having a hard time finding it. I was having a hard time finding work and the jobs I could find, I was not happy with at all. So that song kind of reflects that. And then that leads into Away from the Ruins, where it's sort of like the bastard is, you know, sort of uh, lamenting his state and trying to start up a revolution. And Tower Siege is the, you know, the, hey, we're going to kick down the doors of this radio, uh, this, um, you know, the, the guy that screwed me over from the, the radio station. And, you know, we're going to exact our revenge. Uh, okay, now, okay, now that I have my band camp page in front of me, uh, Bad Doctors it is like him running away. Boom Headshot. Uh, one, hey, who here remembers the uh, beloved series uh, Pure Ponage? I, rem no? I, like, I, remember, I remember the Boom Headshot meme guy. But uh, yeah, I that's where, okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that's where that came from. And that was one of those songs where sometimes I'll just have a lyrical hook mm -hmm. stuck in my head. And I'm like, that works. Nice. And the and the boom yeah. headshot was your was your hook there, yeah exactly nice. So um, and that's like you know him and the girl he ran away with was you know they're doing it in the van. Paper masks is sort of that relationship breaking down and you know her betrayal of the bastard and then bastard's reunion is 
hey, I'm back. But the uh, previous interlude that kind of tells the story, it's like not exactly under his own uh, under his own uh, uh, duress. Okay. Yeah, so that that's kind of the story of Status Quo Radio, and I, you know, I like. There's still some songs I go back to, and am pretty proud of that I did. That sounds awesome. I love the, yeah. I love the like the through thread of the thing, like a, a like a sort of a rock opera album, like the some an album with like a through thread is always very interesting for me. Like, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Discovery from Daft Punk with the whole Interstellar fifty five fifty five thing. Yes, yes, I love that. I saw I, that. I love that as well. Well, I finally saw that after it was announced that uh, Daft Punk broke up, and I'm like, Ugh. this album is half the singles you remember and half just vibes. Yeah, just vibes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so good. Oh, no bro. rules, rest, just vibes. Rest in peace, just off. Rest in peace, Daft mm-hmm. Punk. Like you guys deserve deserve the deserve grander exit. Let's call it that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, Staff Punk, you are, you're, I mean, you, you just retired, but mm. I, I'd like to think that you're, you're robot rocking in heaven right now. Yeah, but they, here's the thing, like, the guys behind the, um, uh, Thomas and Guy Manuel, the guys behind the masks, so, so to speak, the robot, the behind the robots, are, like, they've, they've made it, they were Daft Punk, they were one of the biggest, well, probably still are, one of the biggest, um, uh, dance acts in the world and they yeah. just get to retire with nary a person on the street remembering them like what do they look like they look like the robots everyone knows the robots nobody knows the guys behind the mosques yeah and it's not like and i think they were taught it's not like they released any album after random access memories like they no, came back not, not on their get own lucky. yeah right yeah but they came back with you know get lucky the the quintessential song of the summer mm-hmm do that summer, yeah, two thousand and yeah, two thousand thirteen, twelve, thirteen, yeah. I think it's. I think it might be thirteen. Yeah. Yeah, sounds right. Oh, that was crazy. Um, what was the other thing? Uh, yeah, and then they did a whole bunch of collaborations. I mean, obviously they did the Tron soundtrack and they did stuff with uh, Pharrell and The Weekend and all that. But like, when they broke up, it was eight years since the their last quote-unquote solo album or were they were the headlining act and even then random access memories felt like a bunch of people featuring daft punk to me at least like mm, it, yeah. it didn't it, it definitely didn't sound like discovery it definitely didn't sound like homework but it also had a daft punk sound to it but it, it's like daft punk only sort of influenced it more so than like did the album themselves at least that's how i feel yeah. about that album it's not a bad album by any stretch of the imagination but yeah I'm done. <laughs> no worries. Uh, weird question, actually. In in your live show, you've got like, you, you talk about um, what's the word, uh, marsh pits and the like. How yes. often? How often are there metal bands at these kinds of shows? By the way, like, I know that with furries, I don't think that there's any um, like metal orientated. I know that there's one or two artists out there but i know that the vast majority of it is electro more than anything else um and punk itself is also not as well listened to as it was in the 90s so how do you how do you sort of live through that and it's mostly just like i aggressively (laughs) self-promote and i i try to institute it as sort of a vibe i try to like hype the crowd up as much possible as much as possible because like i chug you know like 12 monster energy drink that's an exaggeration but like i try to be as excited (laughs) as possible before a show because that way i can transfer sort of my energy into the crowd and then they get that back to me and it's sort of this feedback loop Mm. where sure it's like you know you might not enjoy punk music or it's not the popular thing but i at least try to make myself interesting to watch Mm-mm. like i've started doing a couple of things in the past couple of years to sort of you know enhance that crowd involvement like i'll come uh, you know like a show will start and then i will like i'll have a uh just sort of you know like some pre crowd hype music going and then i set one song that it'll like break in the middle of it and it will announce myself, and then I do this whole song and dance as that intro goes on, and that'll lead into the first song, like the first backing track, the first song on my set list. 
Oh, that's and awesome. also after one song I have um, uh, Hunting Bigger Game where the hook is FRI DIY Night Magic. It's a song about like going to Friday Night Magic and playing Magic the Gathering. <laughs> so after that song, I set it so that Magic by Mystery Skulls played and I just throw like a bunch of my old Magic cards out into the crowd. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Nice. Hopefully okay. nothing valuable though, like lands. No, I, like it's my jank tank. So like all the draft, <laughs> like I'll just stop by a comic shop or something the day before and be like, okay, what have like people thrown away extras of? And uh, it's like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, like, cool. Good. Yeah. Okay. Like here's, here's $10. Give me all the jank you have. Yeah. Do you sign all of them? Uh, I can if they bring it up. I don't sign um, all of them. Okay. Because there's a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. For for ten bucks, you can get a lot of draft chaff. Yeah. Like yeah. there are garbage commons. <laughs> oh, there are garbage rares too. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I have the um, what you call it, the uh, uh, TCG player app on my phone, which is a you know a godsend mm -hmm. because as soon as the set rotates out, I'm like, all right, what are like the money ones I should have in my trade binder? Mm. And it'll just scan it and be like, oh, okay, this is worth something. This isn't. This is worth something. This isn't. So mm. I kind of know, like, okay, all the cards in the cardboard box that I pull, you know, whatever out of, they're for the crowd. Yeah. Ugh, I have a horrible, huh. I have a horrible habit of like buying magic cards, like not singles, like buying boosters, and then yeah, yeah it's it like it it's. It's gambling. Like I will admit, it's gambling, but it's like fun gambling where I can at least like sell the, sell the drug I get back. Sometimes, like sometimes you get that nice pull, and it's like, oh sweet, a scalding tarn. I'm not gonna use this necessarily, but I can sell this for money. Yeah, exactly. So it's or hey, I can use this in my commander deck. No, uh, of course, yeah. But then you end up with eighty commander decks. <laughs> yeah, so it's, I have mm. I have like six or seven right now. <laughs> Bravura here mentions that uh, you should get a Sinomatic. I'm considering maybe if you, you know, you, a stamp. Yeah. But even like that, a stamp. Yeah. You can stamp every single one of them. Yeah, that yeah, would be nice. That would work. It should be easier. No, that huh. would be nice. I have a custom stamp made. But yeah, even even that's like, even going through those is. Ugh, it's, a, it's a mission. Like, even going through 100 cards, which is not a high stack feels like a mission i mean it's a hundred times you have to go like get it off the stack put it down stamp it put it away get it off the stack stamp it put it away yeah even when the, with the automatic like picture scanner thing for T the tcg player app mm. it's that oh like beep put it away beep and you have to make sure that it is on just a blank white sheet of paper and nothing else is in the frame otherwise the algorithm or something's going to catch like your thumb or something and mm. then oh wait a second let me position it let me turn the light on again uh, let me uh, fix that yeah any, any good pulls recently um i you know not recently because with you know COVID and everything it's not like i've been going out a lot mm. and the really good card shop i had moved you know an hour south of me so it's not yeah, like i can fine. you know go to friday you know friday night magics regularly but i am playing a, a lot of arena Okay. I, uh, yeah, I'm playing a lot of arena. I'm doing good with like all the, uh, and basically it's just like, I go to see what kind of decks have high win rates and I just have fun playing those. So mm. it's, it's kind of interesting to see how everything works together. Mm. I, I, when I get a chance, I still like, still enjoy playing commander with my friends. Um, yeah. when we might manage to get together and I like, uh, sort of sil silly, fragile, but explosive decks. Like, mm. uh, I don't know if you know Zada Hedron Grinder from back from Zen Zendikar. Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah. I have Zada as a commander. So it's just like, like get an army of goblins out, play a bunch of things that goes onto Zada, copies to everything else. And eventually I swing at you with like eight, 12, nine things with trample. Yeah. Uh, in one turn, I which is amazing. Yeah, like when you get it to pop off, especially if you're doing it with like seven other people mm. and like everybody and, you know, you had some guy who is, you know, has this like finely tuned pro expert level commander deck and like all the counter spells are spent. Yeah. It's like goblins go. Wee! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So just back on track here. Sorry, sorry. Uh, no worries. Completely like off the track with magic there. I've been uh, looking at some of your other or your earlier cover art for um, your albums. I'm assuming that they were self-drawn. Um. Like, so let me just kind of. So I'm uh, just gonna go back on my band camp and check it out. Yeah. Um, so like a couple early ones, I just like kind of photoshopped together and, you know, drew. So like Freddy Fazbear, he said, that's, you know, a slap together. Dino Hunter MD, the soundtrack that I did, uh, you know, draw myself and fire the whole is just, you know, like combination or whatever. But, um, but like the rest since then I've gotten a bunch of artists to, uh, work on them, you know, like I commissioned them and everything. Uh, Status Quo Radio's cover art was done by um, someone who is local to the Florida, you know, comic scene. And I've seen his art a lot. And I'm like, hey, listen, you know, can I commission you for this? And that was one of the ideas he came up with. And I was like, oh, my God, this is great. And what I like to do with, you know, the artists that I commission for work, it's that I just kind of give them like all the music and let them take the creative lead and then we you know work together to break it down and get it so that um so we get something coherent a uh, bastard mania i did have something in mind which was i wanted i didn't want to do like a you know retro 16-bit style uh kind of cover art for it i wanted something that uh, aped the uh no mercy cover from N the n64 game wwf no mercy Interesting. Yes. Uh, on the left there. Uh, so you got, yeah. So on the left there, you got, um, the, the weird thing was, is that it was like, okay, well I'd be in the position of the rock, but you know, the artist uh, at hell breakfast on Twitter, I'm going to post it on chat because they do incredible work. And I really love the uh, work they've doing for the like greatest hits road mix album. I did a uh, hardcore nerdcore punk rock where they turned me into a dragon, which was pretty friggin' cool. Um, so for Bastard Mania, I was going to be in the position of The Rock, and on the left and right, uh, I didn't know who to put, but uh, eventually we came to the conclusion that on the left there is this guy, Jonesy Spencerson, who's kind of like a recurring character in all of the Rhythm Bastard stuff I do, where it's just a name for this old-time radio voice I like to put on, and it was done... <laughs> And I gave that name is like I was doing this old timey radio voice. It was like a spur of the moment thing where I was on a podcast with some friends and it was like, oh, what's what's the name of this guy? And I'm like, Jonesy Spencerson. <laughs> and yeah, jo so like Jonesy Spencerson became this in joke with some podcast friends. Then I was like, OK, well, I can sort of use this old timey radio voice character to be part of the interludes in Status Quo Radio. And then he was also made part of the, the fake wrestling league I'm a part of, but we'll talk about that later. And on the right is Thrash Panda, for, who is, for all intents and purposes, my fursona. With uh, the fursona getting the fursona of Hell Breakfast, the artist, in a headlock there. Huh. Nice. That's awesome. So, yes. Yeah, but mostly it's just like, hey, listen, you know, what do you see in this? Because I want to get a design that they can be excited about as well. Yeah, you have to sort of get the artist to enjoy the enjoy the art as well. That makes a lot of difference. Yeah. So maybe just talk us through Bastard Mania then, uh, since we're on the topic of the album art now. Like, what was yeah, the sure. what, was, what was the thought pattern behind uh, Bastard Mania? So Bastard Mania is uh, okay. So around like late 2019, I first started work for this video game Retro Mania Wrestling. Now, the problem was I was working on it for two years and he gave, and, you know, the guy in charge gave me a bunch of these uh, things to do. And the month the game was supposed to come out back in February of this year, I was like, hey, you know, just figured I'd check in and see if uh, anything, you know, if you need anything, any updates, any, you know, things that sound right once you get them in the game. And he was like, oh, yeah, I got someone else to do it. Like he got someone else to do the entire soundtrack. And a while ago, I was like, oh, well, um, which was confusing because I was working with this guy for like one and a half years. And then a month before, it's like, oh, no, I got somebody else. Uh, and then, yeah, but this but Bastard Mania is all of the music I did for that game. 
and I'm just selling it now to sort of put the thing back in mind. So that's why it's like, I think in the description I put down, it's like a collection of music for a theoretical sprite-based wrestling and video game. <laughs> and as sort of the lead single off that, I put down one of my Patreon songs, Future Endeavor, which I kind of wrote from the perspective of, oh, wait a second, I totally got screwed over by this guy. So let nice. me kind of write this breakup song in the 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 kayfabe, as we call it in the business, of... <laughs> a wrestle, you know, like it, like in the kayfabe of wrestling. Nice. Yeah. That's, that's so, a, that, that, like, that is a really nice, like sort of marrying of a bad situation with the concept of the album. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah so yeah. And it's like, I, I really dig future endeavor. And I think when I start my con circuit, I am going to probably uh, try to work that in there. So, I mean, working through the album, um, is there any particular song that you're like very proud of? I mean, obviously future endeavor, you know, is the, is like the key of that. But as yeah. far as tracks that, uh, the great challenge of working on a video game is that I got to experiment with a lot of different types of music. So I liked some of the, what I came up with for the wrestler intro melody, because I was aping the wrestler intros of actual wrestlers so I would listen to those a few times, let it kind of marinate in my brain, and then all of the prominent aspects I would try to recreate when I'm doing these. I, they're, they, they only gave me 15 seconds to do, you know, like, hey, these can only be 15 seconds and they're going to loop. So that's kind of what I went with. But I did like experimenting with genres and instrumentation for each of these like 16 different wrestlers within the game. Um, I also like, I still like uh, Menu Music, which was a, de uh, a demo track I did for the, for, you know, the, the, the guy to say, hey, listen, what's your sound like? You know, make me this. And he did pay me for it. Like, I wasn't screwed out of money. I was just screwed out of a very big opportunity. But yeah, the Menu Music is kind of what got, you know, him to fall in love with me and be like, oh man, this is so good. I want you to do more music like this. And then a month before the game released, he got Danimal Cannon to do it. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's a bummer. Freaking, uh, that's that a is a bummer. bummer. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, amongst all of the other stuff that you've done here, you've got a whole bunch of other, like, compositions, like Sullen Car commercial song, like Fire in the Hole. What exactly yeah. would... Uh, yeah, like, talk me through... What's so, your... like, Stolen Car yeah. Commercial was, I think I did a bunch of smaller tracks for uh, Patreon one month where I'm like, okay, I'm going to dedicate, like, one or two hours to sort of work on this song that would appear in a commercial. Like, part of that was, oh, here's a synthwave song. Here is a, um, you know, here's the synthwave song. Here's this, like, song you'd hear in a Kickstarter video. Here's the <laughs> song you would... Yeah, so it's just like kind of me experimenting with all of these different kinds of music and saying like, hey, wait a second, let me sort of push my boundaries as, you know, a writer. <laughs> uh, but uh, Fire in the Hole, yeah. Sorry, like the, the, the Kickstarter music, there's always this one jingle that comes into my head. It's like this, like, ukulele and xylophone mix, which is this very, like, I don't know. It's it, like, it. I know it's like just, a, a, a gaff or a goof or whatever but it's like it's too real it's like you can see this as a kickstarter video and that stuff is i find that hilarious but it's good to like you said it's good to sort of work out of your comfort zone and just find um like experiment and do weird stuff yeah and that's you know and that's what i liked about that project and working on the video game so you know you can mm. kind of see me on screenshot saturday trying to be like hey buddy <laughs> But then again, like retro, uh, retro mania was, you know, being at the right place at the right time and just seeing this small project balloon into something bigger. And then I got cut off at the last month, but that's, that's how it goes. Yeah. Lame. Yeah. No. yeah so uh, you also had a question about fire in the hole. Yes. Uh, Fire in the Hole is when I was really into Overwatch and I wrote a song and like it was a song inspired by Junkrat. And 
like the other song I did about an Australian character from a team-based first-person shooter, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like th- just like his main catchphrase was sort of the lyrical hook I worked off of. And I was also, you know, getting back into the band Airborne again. So I was like, all right, let me kind of make this, you know, like song you can draw, you know, song you can listen to while you're driving down the road. And that's how Fire in the Hole came to be. And because it's in drop D, I have to like tune my guitar live, but it's a song I always end with. Nice. Yeah. Just a good like sort of sort of vibey kind of thing. Yeah. Or- like, and I also did a remix of it. For, uh, yeah, so if you go to my page, rhythmbaster.bandcamp.com, you'll notice there's also, like, a secondary version there called Paximania Mix. And that's when I did the a remix of the song for uh, Paximania, which is, like, this part of this thing called League of Heels, which is a sort of, like, wrestling show that a bunch of game developers and game journalists put on at the different PAXs. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I kind of wrote like a version of that because like, oh, wait a second. Can I use it as the uh, intro for this thing? And that was another opportunity where it was like, oh, hey, by the way, um, none of the sound works. <laughs> Damn it. Bad luck. Bad luck. No yeah. Fuss. All right. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh yeah, I've been going through your albums here as well. Um, sure, it also says that you've been doing a fair amount of Magic: The Gathering, not Magic: The Gathering. But it is no, it's the game that we were speaking about earlier. And Jirina. No. Yes, Magic: The Gathering. Yeah, so I do have quite a few songs based off of that. Um, oh. Yeah, so I like I think the most recent so it used to be like as I was more into it and more regularly going to Friday Night Magic, I would try to write a song for each set that came out. And uh, for those of you that don't know how like the the story, quote unquote, behind Magic the Gathering is, it's that you play uh, a, a wizard called a planeswalker who can walk between different planes in existence. And it kind of works like space travel in, you know, like a Star Trek or a Star Wars because, you know, there's all these different kinds of themes of planes. So you have, you know, this one plane called Kaladesh, which is basically like steampunk, but also it's very influenced by Indian culture. You have Ixalan, but it's also, uh, which is like pirate themed, but also it's influenced by Mesoamerican culture and it has a lot of dinosaurs. And vampires. Yes, and vampires. And then you have Innistrad, which is like the gothic horror. So everyone, Mm -hmm. everything kind of uh, breaks up very nicely. And I use those settings as a jumping off point to uh, get my music started. So for Kaladesh, all of my songs on that were you know, influenced by old school punk because it was about talking about this revolution and you're revolting against the consulate. For uh, Ixalan, it was a lot of Celtic punk themes since, you know, it's got that very piratey feel to it. And, you know, there's just a lot of like, there was the writing during that period of game was very good. So, you know, you also had this sort of melancholy feel to it. Mm. Uh, With the Return to Zendikar block, no, not Return to Zendikar, the Battle for Zendikar block, because that was the Zendikar block after I started playing. Zendikar is is supposed to be this like old school like pirate, you know, it's old school adventure one, kind of like Indiana Jones. And but uh, during that block, you were also fighting these giant cosmic horror creatures called the Eldrazi. And going back to the Aquabats earlier, I'm like, huh. You're fighting these like big noodly creatures together. I think I'm gonna base my songs for this block off of the aquabats <laughs> nice yeah it's kind of you can pull like pull um inspiration from different genres to fit with like diff- like those different themes as well which is really awesome There's a theme of each plane at least yeah mm. so yeah i was wrong i was thinking D for some reason but magic the gathering was what i was looking for but I mean, like, so it's it's songs like Hunting, uh, Bigger Game, uh, Anguished, Unmaking, and the like. Yes. Yeah? Ah, okay. Yeah. 
definitely want to play more of those. I've mostly only been delving into album one and two. So uh, Dino Hunter and Status Quo Radio have been the songs that I've been playing. And of course, okay. Thrash Panda. Yes. Um, but we're definitely going to be delving into some of the other songs a bit more. Yeah, but Vero mentioned they just uh, bought the album uh, Bastard Mania for for play, so that's available in our collection yes, now. Yes, thank you. Mm. But yeah, so I mean, like, and obviously music isn't the only thing that you're doing. Uh, you want yes. to walk us through that a bit? So, um, okay, uh, I do a bit of acting as well. Oh. Uh, I am part of the 3000 Brigade, which is a cosplay acting troupe uh, down here in South Florida. And we do a lot of shows at conventions or not a lot of shows, but we usually do like one show a year at, um, you know, this one convention toward the end of the year. And it's really fun just seeing this show put together from concept to, you know, performance. And I really like doing that. So usually it's this big mishmash of all different characters from, you know, various pop culture things. So just to give you an example, I've played um, the male Wii Fit Trainer. I've played Chris <laughs> Redfield from Resident Evil. I've played Tenya Ida from My Hero Academia. Uh, Johnny Cage from uh, Mortal, Mortal Kombat. Kombat. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of like all over the place with that. But, yeah, it is fun to put the show together. And granted, you know, because we haven't been doing any cons at all, uh, we haven't, like, prepared a show for the past couple of years. But, you know, we still do, like, little skits and stuff. All right, at least you guys keep, still keep busy even during lockdown. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, like, some of the people who work with the 3000 Brigade, they did a podcast called Taste of Dragons that I did do the uh, music for, the the podcast intro for. Oh, nice. That's cool. Yeah, so let's go put it there in chat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um See, I'm also part of two podcasts. One is I'd Rather Not, a show about bad decisions and how we make them. And we just kind of take these would you rather prompts and we talk through them, we work through them, and shenanigans ensue. A lot of improv, a lot of goofy stuff right there. Uh, and then I'm also part of, speaking of D&D, &D, RPG Pals Club, which you can find at rpgpals.club. And it is about just five disaster millennials uh, <laughs> trying to open up a dog cafe, but also we're trying to do the water deep dragon heist setting. So, <laughs> eh. yeah, my my player character is Oi, a punk drow monk. <laughs> and nice. like one of the major things was we're doing a battle of the bands because since Oi is from the Underdark and you need a bardic license to perform in water deep. Uh, that was him, like, it was, like, him and one of the other party members who's, like, a bard uh, trying to get our licenses in a battle of the bands. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that sounds so, well, yeah, that sounds really cool. But at least you guys have a tavern now where you can play. Oh, well, cafe, yeah, I but, suppose. Well, yeah, but now we're, um, yeah, but now we're kind of spread all over the D&D &D multiverse trying to get the different uh, keys to the Dragon Heist. All uh, right, yeah. Spoilers for those of you who don't know the campaign. Uh, minor spoilers. Yeah, minor spoilers. Um, like, how does one, as as a musician, how does one differentiate oneself from other other bands out there? Have you been able to find the magic, sort of, I don't know. The yeah, magic bullet, magic formula. Uh, yeah. Have you been able to find that? Not really, because a lot of it and just how, you know, the Internet works. A lot of what I'm doing is just through brute force. And it's just a lot of working that hustle. So, you know, I do try to put myself out there. But a lot of what I do is just like trying to keep contacts with people and trying to be in as open as possible to these new ventures so like the D, D podcast or the you know i'd rather not podcast so at the very least i can do something that would lead them back to me all right that's cool at least it, yeah. it leaves a little bit of room for cross promotion i hope at least yeah so you know i can do the 3000 brigade stuff i can do you know the D, &D stuff and because i've been part of so much one like thing i'm trying to do is I have a 
wrestling league that I run out of uh, Fire Pro Wrestling World called Hardcore Nerdcore Wrestling. Mm -hmm. And it's basically just characters from all the various like stuff that I've been a part of. So like characters we've made up from I'd rather not and random like all of our player characters from the D&D podcast and video game characters who showed up in the 3000 Brigade and, you know, like Jonesy Spencerson and Thrash Panda are also there. Nice. Thrash Panda is currently the like holder of the top title. <laughs> Somewhat embarrassing, but like, hey, listen, I can't, you know, I, I can't deny it's all random. So. Shrug emoji. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Um, any future projects that you're currently working on? Or working towards? Uh, so actually, the most recent thing I've done is I'm part of Link 182, a compilation album, which is a bunch of, uh, yeah, so a pop punk tribute to the Ocarina of Time. And it's just a bunch of other, you know, VGM and nerdcore artists working together to cover the different uh, songs off of the Ocarina of Time soundtrack. And the one I covered was the Water Temple theme. Ooh. Nice. Yeah. That's yeah. And that was, I, and again, it's another thing to kind of like, okay, let me break this down and put it something a bit more familiar in my style. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. I'd actually love to give that a listen. I don't really. I, I, I've watched playthroughs of Ocarina of Time because I never had an N sixty four. But yeah, and I know some of those songs. Obviously, some of the Legend of Zelda things are inseparable. Like you can't not have like the fairy fountain music anywhere. So oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that kind of stuff it sticks with you for sure. Like I'd love to give it a listen. Oh, it, yeah. No, there's yeah. a lot of great people on there. Like, I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, Ben Briggs and Robora before, and they're they're incredible. Uh, Ro Panoganti, I think I was part of like a, a, a showcase called uh, Virtual Ongaku, part of the Ongaku Overdrive, which is this company that puts on a lot of live shows here down in Florida, and they also have been streaming them. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, I see that, that you know, this... Um... Uh, what's his name? Game Grooves does some interesting stuff. They're like a metal tribute to Dark Souls, an electronic tribute to Star Fox 64, a jazz tribute yeah. to Persona 5. That's interesting. Yeah, it's and I think uh, one of the upcoming, pro one of the proposed projects was a ska tribute to Mario Kart. <laughs> nice. I'm like, yeah, that works. Yeah, for sure. I can I mean, see that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Everything is like already like sort of sort of, sort of trumpet heavy, like ba -da 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 -da, kind of. Yeah, I get that. I could definitely see that happening. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, hmm. What else is there with? What else? What else? Actually, yeah. Let's let's maybe talk about that. Is there anything else that that sort of that you have that that you'd like to be able to speak about right now? Um, I think so. Right. I talked about Link 182. The next album I'm planning mm -hmm. on doing um, it is currently like a great I have, you know, proper album number three somewhere in the ether. But because I'm, you know, on the Patreon grind, um, I like I can't really sit down and do a bunch of stuff for that. But what I uh, have been doing is like I've been alternating like one month I do a cover and one month I do an original song to sort of give me a little bit more breathing room in that regard. Um, but yeah, so the next thing I'm probably gonna put out is hardcore nerdcore punk rock, which is uh, greatest hits combined with like a road mix, all the songs I play live, because you know, the album I have for sale at conventions is status quo radio. And it's a very hard sell for people to say, hey, here's this cool concept album I did. You know, it's a rock opera, it's all this other stuff that I happen to play a couple songs off of. You know, uh, hardcore nerdcore punk rock, it's something new, it's something shiny, and it's something I can, you know, like point to like, hey, if you like the music I played, here's, you know, proper recordings of all the songs, like most of the songs I tend to play live. Nice. Um, <clears throat> would you, like, oddly enough, like, I think the the, the whole MIDI guitar thing, or not MIDI guitar, the, the MIDI drums in the background, like, is that a... It is MIDI drums, yeah? Yeah, MIDI, yeah. Yeah. Um, like, is, are you, would you ever consider replacing that? 
I, I mean, I would like to. It's just a matter of availability because, mm. yeah, I mean, the way I work is just very scatterbrained. So I might have a really good lyrical hook and a really good riff, and I might not think to combine those two together until, you know, months down the line. Okay. All right. So I think, yeah. I mean, other than that, I mean, the music has always been, like, really good to listen to. And, uh, Thank you. Like, like I said, the the response from our listeners has always been relatively uh, positive whenever I'm playing one of your songs, then yeah, I think it's, it's a, it's good that you're continuing sort of going. I know that for, for many people, the whole pandemic thing has actually slowed a large amount of things down and that yeah. you've, you've sort of ramped up just a bit. Yeah. I mean, that's just because like, I have no other option you know, because it's like, I don't have a uh, proper, what is it a proper like con to prepare for it's like well i guess i can put more time into writing and a couple other conventions have kind of you know put their stake la especially last year into well we can't do this live so let's just kind of have a streaming thing that people can still tune in and watch so i think i played like three live streaming concerts this year i play uh last year rather i played a uh, virtual ngaku i played um a uh, Megaplex online and I played uh, Mizukon online. So, you know, like cons are, you know, last year cons did try to make up the difference, but now as, you know, more people are getting vaccinated and things are kind of getting back to manageable, it's going to be, you know, like all of the, the, those concerns that, hey, listen, there's still a lot of people that haven't been vaccinated yet or people who just, you know, still think it's not real. Um, you know, running about, well, you know, there's, it, it's at least calm enough so that you're obligated to put on the shows again, because otherwise it's like, well, you know, cons have to back out and they have to break contracts with the hotels and everything. So it can be quite messy. Mm. Awesome. Um, personal question. And uh, hopefully I'm hoping if you can take one, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so obviously punk rock, uh, bases itself in sort of again an anarchic backgrounding, sort of a not necessarily apolitical, but definitely from a political perspective. Have you ever felt that because you play punk rock, uh, that you're sort of following that kind of same um, sort of backgrounding? Um, I I mean I think definitely because when you know, one thing I usually like to sort of point out to people is your politics are your priorities. So depending on what you focus on, what you choose to write about, what you choose to, um, you know, I guess like how you choose to present yourself is all based on what you prioritize. And for me, I do, you know, I do like, you know, performing for the furry crowd because it's creators owning the means of production. You're not waiting for a corporation or, you know, one exact creator to sort of come down upon you and say, here, here's what you need. Everybody can kind of do it ourselves. And that's, you know, what the, the vibe I want to, you know, and that's the vibe I end up going with. Like, I think the last song I dropped off on Patreon was called Boss Fight where I try to, you know, incorporate all this video game, you know, sort of things like level up and, you know, like prepare for the raid, but it's a song about actually, you know, fighting your boss who doesn't respect you. So that's one thing I'm trying to do more of while using the video game, like grounding and the nerd grounding and all of that, because that's just what I choose to immerse myself in, but also kind of like trying to make these honest statements within that framework. Oh, that's awesome. Um, sorry, my voice is going. That's half the reason why I haven't been speaking a lot. Um, other question. Uh, favorite, favorite video game? Uh, that changes pretty much every week. <laughs> a lot of video games I have been playing now are just like you know, grindy stuff I can play every day. Like, I love playing Fortnite. I actually, one of the first, uh, you know, like, first suit ads I did make is one of uh, Meowsles. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, like, just something I can check in every day. But as far as, like, a game that stuck with me that I would wholeheartedly, like, recommend everyone play, probably be Silent Hill 2 is mm -hmm. definitely up there. A Deadly Premonition. Ugh. Just because it's an entire vibe that sticks with you. And like, 
somewhat like you just have to play it even though like some of it's janky and i ended up like grinding through a lot of the later part of that game to the squeeze greatest of hits um mm. like it's still it that's that really kind of worked to its advantage as well like that's a game i'd recommend um I think the walk season one of the Telltale's Walking Dead, that was mm -hmm. an experience that nobody has been able to replicate yet because it was essentially a water cooler game. Mm -hmm. Like it would come out once a month and you'd be like, oh man, what did you decide to do? Oh, what did you decide to do? Oh, what did you do when you, you know, like everyone would kind of like discuss, the, you know, whatever they did. Um, I always go back to the remake of the first Resident Evil. Uh huh. That, that's a good game. So, you know, I play it randomized a lot. And, I, you know, there, there's, like, favorite series I go back to. There's favorite games I go back to. But as far as, like, the number one favorite, I can't really say since, like, that changes every so often. All right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Ugh. Huh. I haven't had time to play a lot of games recently, but I, I'd love to make some more. Or at least I need to find something to play. <laughs> like, I can't yeah. really go back to my old favorites because my old favorites are, like, don't have a lot of replay value, unfortunately. Like, you can't replay Portal. You know yeah. what's going to happen. Or you know, like, where everything goes. And I, I can't... You can speed run it. I guess, yeah. but speed But then again, if it's thing, like... Yeah. yeah, but like... Yeah, that's a different thing than, like, experiencing the story again. Exactly. Not even... Oh, the, not wait, even Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. That's the game I always go back to. Oh, of course. Like, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater oh. 2 and SSX 3. Of course. Go back to all of those all the time. <laughs> Which... Sorry, I didn't catch that. Which one? Tony Hawk's Pro Skater uh, Tony 2. Hawk's Pro Skater Tony 2. Hawks. Oh, okay. Nice. We played that. SSX3. Like, yeah. Yeah. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 had a banging soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> and I love what SSX3 did with its soundtrack, where, you know, when you have this, like, these big jumps, everything kind of drops out, and you're left with, like, just the faintest hint of the melody, and then when you land, everything kicks back in. It's just this oh, awesome, yeah. like, oh, hell yeah moment. Oh, that's cool. That's so cool. Mean, like, it, it played to a completely different crowd. And oddly enough, I mean, you were listening to just look at the music that they used there. If it was pretty much um, sort of an idea of anarchic uh, kind of soundtracks and everything. I mean, you had uh, uh, Fuck You, I Don't Do What You Tell Me. Um, oh, yeah. Um, what's his name? Rage Against the Machine. Rage no? Against the Machine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and. Like that's that's what I was trying to get at when I was asking you about your musical and uh, your your musical preferences, is that I mean Rage Against had, like this extremely, sort of open ideas to what they wanted to like speak about, mm. and it seems like you sort of have that same kind of ideology, uh, which is I guess I'd, and stop me if I'm pigeonholing you. Um, but it, it, it feels like that. It's one of the reasons why we were drawn to you in the first place, at least I was, because it, it felt like you had that sort of anarchic sort of backgrounding. That's, that's something that, again, calls to me just a little bit from, oddly enough, the punk history that Scratch gave me quite often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that definitely makes sense. I mean, I just kind of put out what I put out and... Like I said, it's your priorities. It's the through line. I like making loud music about, I mean, mostly about like just trying to break out of some kind of mold. And then sometimes I'll write about like a webcomic I really like. Like First Day of Spring was based off the webcomic Lore Olympus. And then I have a song called I Want a Krampus for Christmas. <laughs> Uh -huh. I, listen, that's because it's just <laughs> like for some reason Krampus became a hot commodity and monster screwing became a hot commodity. So I'm like, maybe we can finally unseat Mariah Carey. <laughs> oh, <God>. uh, <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. See, yeah. uh, I have a bit of an issue with Christmas. Everyone says Christmas is sneaking in earlier and earlier every year, right? Yeah. The Americans at least have a boundary as to how far Christmas can sneak in. Like Christmas will not intrude on Thanksgiving. For us, the Christmas stuff goes up in October. I, I mean, to be fair, it, it kind of is like this as well, because yes, you know, from an outside, it does seem like, okay, well, you know, that's because 
at least in America, we make a huge deal out of Black Friday. And that's whenever, you know, because that's when like, okay, Christmas is the next holiday. We want to get that in as soon as possible. Mm. But now you are starting to see Christmas trees at like Walmart and stuff go up in October. You're starting to see, you know, door, like you're starting to see after um, like Thanksgiving day sales, like, hey, after you have that turkey, you might want to get some shopping done. Yeah. Yeah, but at least yes. at least Thanksgiving makes a nice little convenient little boundary. Like I don't, you guys have at least a delineation as to how far Christmas can sneak into other holidays. Because as far as I know, Thanksgiving is not an insignificant holiday in the U.S. Oh yeah, it's a pretty big one. Like yeah. everyone gets the next like Thanksgiving and the next day off. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So but Thanksgiving is pretty much just Christmas in October, in August, and then November. Oh, November, but any it's yeah the, the the reason why Thanksgiving exists is the problem that I have with it yeah, fair enough yeah no that's true yeah we don't celebrate anything like that here yeah. for obvious reasons okay yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it's a it's a, a country specific a cultural specific holiday we have Bride Day which is nice uh, what's it called Barbecue uh, day, pretty much. Basically, barbecue. Oh, okay. day, yeah, like we, it, it's it's heritage day because, but yeah, it's just been like colloquially shortened to, uh, well, barbecue day, like in essence, bride day. Uh, so okay, it's yeah, it doesn't have to be like at on the uh, this year. Thankfully, it falls on a Friday, so we get, mm -hmm. um, what's his name, get the long weekend. But yeah. um, it's it's literally a day off where people are encouraged to just like get some people together and. Like have a barbecue and just enjoy things. Yeah. Enjoy enjoy the multicultural heritage of our country. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Hmm. But yeah, I have I have a beef with Christmas. Yeah, I. <laughs> it's it's weird like the kind of beefs that we I I have a beef with Thanksgiving. It's Unders weird. Understandably. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it. No, that's an understandable one, and I mean, you can't like make an argument for Christmas just because of how, I guess, obligatory it can feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. Look, uh, it, at least at least it's a holiday for anybody who has Christmas off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've you know, okay, I've actually seen this happen, and I'm not sure if it's if it's the same custom over that side. But I've actually seen stores these days give you a choice. You either get Christmas Day off or you get New Year's Day off. Oof. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, because usually we get both days. No, yeah. We, yeah, we get New Year's Day off and Christmas Day off. Hmm. No Boxing Day? Yeah, no uh, bo uh, yeah. Boxing Day. Yeah. I mean... I mean, like here, Boxing Day is the day before Christmas. Was it the day before? Or the day after? No, day after Christmas. I'm sorry. No, oh, same. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the 25th and the 26th. Yeah. But yeah, like it's it's literally been that um, stores these days have not. They might give the 25th off, but they won't give the 26th off. Yeah. And if you choose the 26th, then you can't get the 31st. Ugh. Or the the first. I am. Ooh. So thankful I don't work retail. Yeah. Anyway, I think yeah, I think we've covered all the topics. Uh, again, if if we've missed any. Mm. And uh, yeah, please feel free to plug anything that we haven't plugged already. If there is anything that you would like to uh, put forth. Um, I guess I can just plug my sites. You know, you can mm -hmm. find pretty much everything I do at my website, rhythmbastard.rocks. Uh, you can get my music Rocks, at... Rocks, R-O-C-K-S or R -O R -O -C -K -S, yes. Okay. R-O-C-K-S. R-O-C-K-S. Mm. That was a hard one to spell right there. Um, uh, yeah, so you can find all my music at rhythmbaster.bandcamp.com. I have a Patreon where you can support me because I put up new songs pretty much every month at patreon.com slash rhythmbastard. Uh, and you can also buy some merch from me at shop.rhythmbastard.rocks. It is like a threadless store right now. So you get like my kick drum logo. I've got, um, you know, a little synthwave tank tops. I got just a whole bunch of cool stuff. And I recently did drop a Thrash Panda t-shirt. And there's oh. going to be more things coming up soon. Nice. Yeah. Did you say threadless? 
Yes, it's a Threadless store. So it's rhythmbastard.threadless.com. I've I just them. have shop.rhythmbastard.rocks because I like to try to keep the brand the same. Mm. So, um, you know, I also have like my band camp links to music.rhythmbastard.rocks. Okay. I've bought from Threadless before. I love their stuff. Oh, yeah. Like their tank tops are incredible. Yeah. Their shirts are comfortable as hell as well. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, for, yeah. with that, thank you for uh, joining us. I really do appreciate you being here. And uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah. We'll have the, for those of you who might have missed out on the, either the start of this or have joined in now, um, we are going to have that video up uh, tomorrow. Scratch. Most likely. Tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. So we'll have that video up tomorrow uh, with all of the with all of the conversation that was held. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining. Really appreciate it. No, thank you. I've seen a lot of like thank yous in chat. So thank you guys for stopping by. As far as shows go, um, I do my like usual like wrestling stream Thursday nights at 9 p.m. And my next two cons confirmed are Megaplex in Orlando, Florida, the first weekend in August. And that show is going to be Friday at midnight. And then I'm going to be playing Mizukon in Miami, Florida, Labor Day weekend in September. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Good luck for those. Thank you. Sweet. Um, yeah. Uh, like I said, we'll have this video up uh, tomorrow on YouTube, most likely, followed by some more uh, earlier stuff uh, from previous ones that we forgot to upload. My bad. Um, <coughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'll, I'll get to it. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll, we'll also keep you in the loop um, about uh, when the video goes up so you can put it on your Twitter as well. Oh, totally. Thank you. Cool stuff. All right, uh, Ivik's going to be playing some music after this, correct? Yippers, going to be playing all the way to midnight. Cool stuff. Um, so, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy that, and we shall see the rest of you sometime soon. Yes. Have, a, have a good evening, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a good evening. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Cool. Cheers, Bye. cheers.